All right. Hope, I don't know. Can JT hear me? Hi, JT. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Great. We'll uh, we'll put you online here. Thanks for uh, joining us remotely. And, uh, okay. Oh, good. Perfect. I was going to ask if you could see what's happening. I'm not sure what the what it looks like on your end, but it is it is all you whenever you're ready. Okay. You guys can't see me, right? You can see your two slides. That's right. We just see your screen. We might be better off that way. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, this is just uh, I'm just giving a quick few few quick slides here. So you know, here you guys have heard about Grace a lot of the past few days and. I was able to tune in yesterday and hear the, hear the uh, panel discussion on smoke testing and ECQ techniques and uh, very, very interesting stuff. So, you know, just to, just to give you a uh, uh, view from uh, 10,000 feet here, so this is kind of what NASA thinks of as a golden age of water cycle and freshwater availability observation. Because we now have a mission that covers almost every aspect of the terrestrial water cycle. You know, we're getting evaporation, we're getting uh, atmospheric water vapor, transport over land, precipitation, snow, rivers and lakes from SWAT, we're getting groundwater from grazing, and uh, so much from SNAP. We've got all these things covered. But I think the next question uh, observationally is, you know, how to add integrated value to these measurements. We're observing all these things, but, you know, how good of a job are we actually doing at representing every spatial and temporal space? And so if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, what, what we, one thing we do at NASA, you know, is every 10 years or so we have this uh, the Cato survey, and we just had this, in, in which we'll uh, get an opinion by the community of what's happening in the field and what are the major questions are in, in hydrology, for instance. And then, um, you know, we'll write these RFIs on what are the next things that we need to be observing as a community. And so those RFIs so go into the National Academy. Right, National Research Council are full of plots like this. So it has a plot of all of the processes in hydrology. You know, usually these are kind of drawn by hand and done kind of subjectively. And then, if you could advance, please. Then what we do is we draw all right, maybe what missions we have or what missions we're thinking about creating and how they map onto this, these processes. Right, and so. You know, you can see, like, you know, great, you know, we get a little groundwater here, coarse resolution, that type of thing, and maybe mix mm -hmm. of groundwater processes, that type of thing. So it gives us an idea, though, of what we're doing and, and where, we need to, where we need to head. So if you could advance the slide, please. So I try to make one of these uh, just for groundwater, and I would have updated this yesterday after I had heard um, uh, from... Um, I think it was uh, Burke there with the, with the uh, electromagnetic stuff from Airborne. That was, that was incredibly interesting. I'd like to hear more about that. But if you could advance again, you know, with groundwater, we've kind of got this going on. Where we've got it from space. At least. So we've got, you know, grace over there on the right. We get the course of stuff. We've got uh, INSAR. We've got subsidence, you know, around uh, the kind of middle region. From there. And then, of course, in C2 well monitoring over there on the left. And so with those three, we almost have some coverage of the entire uh, suite of groundwater processes and, and scales. At least we're getting there. And there's definitely a gap in the middle there probably where, where electromagnetic or some other technique could help fill in. But the point with this is that, you know, the framework for, for which to place these observations into probably has to be modeling, right? And when we have uh, the ability to model across scales, and when we have the ability to model with good uncertainties, then we're better able to place observations into context that has meaning. So a lot of times I think we're observing things at different resolutions or different, different scales, and it's, it's hard to get context for them, especially with race, for instance. And you've got such a coarse overview of what's happening that it's really difficult sometimes to relate that to what's happening on the ground with actual well observations, with the common understanding of groundwater atmosphere. So could you go to the next slide, please? I'm almost done here. So one thing I wanted to talk about is kind of the possibility of, 
you know, how do we understand the uncertainty of a system as opposed to the uncertainty of a measurement? So typically, right, at NASA, we're considered with the left side, right? Consider the uncertainty of a measurement, instrument error, forward propagation uncertainty, so single variable, how do we do uncertainty, or what are the sources of uncertainty? Where really, on the, on, we, we should probably start be thinking about things on the right side, which is how does uncertainty propagate across processes? How much does a new measurement decrease the general domain uncertainty? So, you know, you've got a modeling system, whether that's a, a land surface model or a groundwater model, and that model magnifies somehow. And if modelers can do a good job of estimating the uncertainty in their models, the uncertainty in their parameter values, and then we come in with a single piece of information or multiple pieces of information from observation with uncertainty, then we have the ability to kind of quantify the total domain uncertainty that still exists in that place. So that's why I'm kind of laying this out as a, as a goal for modeling, I think, is, is to say, okay, you know, through the combination of models and observations, contextualizing and combining unique pieces of information, but doing so with proper uncertainty quantification, then we have the ability to understand how much uncertainty remains in a system, and therefore where the gaps in information are and where to target future observations. And of course, that's something we can do about it. So uh, next slide, please. I think this is my last question. So this is just, you know, you know how this would work. You know, you've got some model uncertainty, you've got some observation uncertainty. You combine the two and, you know, you do a data simulation or something similar, and hopefully you get some results that can include improved best estimate of whatever you're estimating, as well as a combined uncertainty that is reduced from having these two sources of information, where maybe the model reveals something about the process and the observation reveals uh, something about uh, you know, biases or, or, or parameter. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there. That's just kind of 